my friends of the road and home and everywhere for about 25 years. Here's one, a truly a legend in his own time. This is Johnny Cash. All in all, if the curtain should fall, all I hope that it falls on. Waylon Jennings was a well-loved musician, celebrated for his heartfelt songs delving into themes of heartbreak, tough times, and difficult decisions. His own life mirrored the struggles he sang about, filled with pain, challenges, and sorrow. Sadly, he passed away due to heart problems linked to his past lifestyle choices. Join us as we explore the life and tragic end of Waylon Jennings, early life. Waylon Jennings came into the world on June 15, 1937, on the J.W. Bittner Farm near Littlefield, Texas. His parents, Lorene Beatrice and William Albert Jennings, formed the solidly built foundation of his upbringing. Hailing from a lineage blending Irish and Black Dutch roots, Waylon was the eldest among his siblings, Tommy, James, and Beau. The Jennings clan boasted a rich heritage, with Waylon tracing his ancestry back to a Tennessee farmer and lawman, with whispers of Cherokee and Comanche blood adding to the family tapestry. Interestingly, Waylon's journey with his name began with a twist of fate. Originally christened as Wayland, it took a chance encounter with a Baptist preacher to steer his moniker towards its eventual spelling, Waylon. Loreen, initially unaware of the namesake connection to Wayland Baptist University, made the adjustment at the preacher's suggestion. Reflecting on his given name, Wayland confessed in his autobiography a certain initial disdain, finding it corny and hillbilly. However, as life unfolded, he grew into his name, acknowledging its significance with a sense of acceptance. Wayland's early years were marked by humble beginnings, as his father toiled as a laborer on the Bittner farm before relocating the family to Littlefield. There, William Jennings laid the groundwork for their livelihood by establishing a retail creamery, setting the stage for Waylon's journey into the world of music and beyond. Jennings' Musical Journey By age eight, Waylon Jennings began his musical journey, guided by his mother who introduced him to the guitar with the song 30 Pieces of Silver. With a growing passion for music, Waylon practiced on borrowed instruments until he got his own Stella guitar later upgrading to a Harmony Patrician. Inspired by legends like Bob Wills, Hank Williams, and Elvis Presley, Waylon's musical influences were diverse. He performed at family gatherings, local youth centers, and clubs, gaining experience and recognition. His talent shone through at a talent showcase in Lubbock, where he impressed with Hey Joe. At 14, Waylon auditioned for KVOW in Littlefield, impressing station owner J.B. McShann and Emil Macha, who recorded him. This led to a weekly program on KVOW, and the formation of his band, the Texas Longhorns, despite some controversy over their musical style. At 16, Waylon faced disciplinary issues at school and dropped out, focusing on work with his father and various temporary jobs. Yet his passion for music remained unwavering, driving him towards his musical destiny. The following year, with the Texas Longhorns by his side, Waylon stepped into the world of recording, laying down demo tracks like Stranger in My Home and There'll Be a New Day at KFYO Radio in Lubbock. Balancing his musical ambitions with odd jobs, he drove trucks for companies like Thomas Land Lumber and Roberts Lumber, though he left the latter after a minor accident due to dissatisfaction with the owner. Music remained a constant in Waylon's life, often finding him at KDAV, a country radio station where he befriended Buddy Holly. Their chance meeting blossomed into a friendship, with Waylon becoming a regular at Holly's performances on KDAV's Sunday Party. In 1956, Waylon broadened his horizons by becoming a radio DJ in Lubbock. His show, airing from late afternoon till evening, featured a mix of country classics, contemporary hits, and a touch of rock and roll. However, his diverse musical taste led to his dismissal after playing two Little Richard records in a row, much to the station owner's dismay. During his time at KVOW, Waylon caught the attention of DJ Sky Corbin from KLVT in Leveland, who was impressed by his vocal talent. After witnessing Waylon's skill firsthand, Corbin was struck by his financial struggles as he grappled with a modest $50 a week salary. Corbin saw potential in Jennings and offered him his position at KLVT when it became available. The Corbin family's acquisition of KLLL in Lubbock marked a turning point as they changed the station's format to country, becoming a rival to KDAV. They appointed Jennings as the station's first DJ, launching a new phase in his career. At KLL, Jennings excelled, creating commercials and jingles with his colleagues. Public appearances became common, with Jennings often performing live. 
During one event, fate intervened when Buddy Holly's father, L.O. Holly, approached them with Holly's latest record, sparking Corbin's recommendation of Jennings for artist production. After returning from England, Buddy Holly visited KLLL, strengthening Jennings' bond with the rock and roll icon and opening doors for future collaborations. Holly saw potential in Jennings as an artist and worked on refining his image and public persona. To kickstart Jennings' music career, Holly organized a recording session at Norman Petty's studios in Clovis, New Mexico on September 10th. Jennings, Holly, Tommy Alsup on guitars, and saxophonist King Curtis recorded tracks like Joel Blown and When Sin Stops, Love Begins. Impressed by Jennings' musical versatility, Holly further enlisted him as the bassist for his Winter Dance Party tour, cementing their collaborative bond and propelling Jennings into the spotlight of the burgeoning rock and roll scene. Winter Dance Party Tour with Buddy Holly. Before starting their tour, Buddy Holly took a break with his wife in Lubbock, Texas, visiting Jennings' radio station in December 1958. During this visit, Jennings and Sky Corbin contributed hand claps to Holly's track, You're the One. Their journey continued to New York and then to Chicago, where they met the rest of the band by train. The Winter Dance Party Tour began in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on January 23, 1959. However, logistical issues arose as the tour progressed, with long distances between venues and the tour buses breaking down twice in freezing weather. Drummer Carl Bunch was hospitalized for frostbite on his toes. Facing challenges, Holly decided to find alternative transportation. Before their performance at the Surf Ballroom in Clear Lake, Iowa, Holly chartered a four-seat Beechcraft Bonanza airplane from Dwyer Flying Service in Mason City, Iowa. This was to speed up their travel to their next destination in Moorhead, Minnesota, avoiding the difficult bus journey. After the Clear Lake show ended around midnight, a coin toss decided that Tommy Alsup would give up his seat on the plane to Richie Valens. At the same time, Waylon Jennings offered his seat to J.P. Richardson, the big bopper, who was sick and couldn't handle the bus ride. In a moment of joking between Holly and Jennings, they teased each other about their different modes of transportation. Holly said, I hope your bus freezes up. And Jennings replied, well, I hope your plane crashes. Sadly, less than 90 minutes later, around 1 a.m. on February 3rd, 1959, Holly's plane crashed into a cornfield outside Mason City, Iowa, taking everyone's lives and changing music history forever. When the news of the crash spread, Jennings's family heard it on the radio. Worried about his safety, Jennings contacted Sky Corbin from Fargo to assure his loved ones and colleagues that he wasn't on the plane. The General Artists Corporation offered to pay for first-class tickets for Jennings and the band to attend Holly's funeral in Lubbock, Texas, on the condition that they still performed in Moorhead that night. Though the venue hesitated to pay them after the show, Jennings persisted and eventually got their compensation. Despite being promised reimbursement for their flights, Jennings and Tommy Alsup never received payment. Nevertheless, they continued the tour for two more weeks, with Jennings taking over as lead singer. However, the money they earned fell far short of what was agreed upon. When they returned to New York, Jennings carefully stored away Holly's beloved guitar and amplifier in a locker at Grand Central Terminal, sending the keys to Maria Elena Holly before heading back to Lubbock. In the early 1960s, still mourning the loss of his friends, Jennings poured his emotions into a tribute song. He wrote and recorded The Stage, Stars in Heaven, honoring not only Richie Valens, the Big Bopper, and Buddy Holly, but also Eddie Cochran, who died in a tragic accident a year after the plane crash. For years after the crash, Jennings struggled with guilt and turned to substance abuse as a way to cope. This guilt weighed heavily on him throughout his career, from roadblocks to country stardom. In March 1959, Joel Blon was released on Brunswick Records, but didn't achieve much success. Feeling stuck in his music career, Jennings returned to KLL. However, the grief from Holly's death affected his performance at the station. Disheartened by the lack of a raise, Jennings left KLL and briefly worked at rival station KDAV. Personal responsibilities led Jennings to move between Arizona and Texas, briefly working at Coil in Odessa. Eventually settling in Coolidge, Arizona, near his wife Maxine's family, Jennings continued to pursue his musical dreams. He performed at the Galloping Goose Bar, catching the attention of Earl Perrin, who offered him a spot on KC Tiggy Radio. Jennings impressed audiences during intermissions at drive-in theaters and local bars, especially at the Cross Keys Club in Phoenix. 
Contractors Paul Pristo and Dean Kaufman noticed his talent and enlisted him as the main attraction for a new club they were building in Scottsdale called JD's. Musel tailored the club's atmosphere to fit Jennings act with his band, the Whalers, including members like bassist Paul Foster, guitarist Jerry Gropp, and drummer Richie Albright, Jennings gained a loyal following at JD's. Here, he developed his unique blend of rock-influenced country music, setting the stage for his influential career. In 1961, Jennings signed a significant recording deal with Trend Records, marking the beginning of his music career. His debut single, Another Blue Day, achieved moderate success, paving the way for future endeavors. Jennings' friend Don Bowman played a key role in boosting his career. Bowman shared Jennings' demos with Jerry Moss, who, along with Herb Alpert, was establishing A&M Records. In July 1963, Jennings officially joined A&M, securing a contract that entitled him to 5% of record sales. At A&M, Jennings released several recordings, including Love Denied and Rave On, as well as a cover of Ian Tyson's Four Strong Winds and Just to Satisfy You. He also worked on demos of songs like The Twelfth of Never, Kisses Sweeter Than Wine, and Don't Think Twice It's All Right. Jennings even took on production duties for the single Sing the Girls a Song Bill, backed with The Race Is On, released between April and October 1964. Despite his talent, Jennings faced challenges at A&M, where the focus was mainly on folk music rather than country. Yet he found success in Phoenix with hits like Four Strong Winds and Just to Satisfy You, the latter being a collaboration with Bowman. Alongside his work at A&M, Jennings recorded an album for BT Records titled J.D.'s Waylon Jennings, later reissued as Waylon Jennings at J.D.'s due to its popularity. He also showcased his versatility by playing lead guitar on Patsy Montana's 1964 album. Bobby Bear discovered Jennings' Just to Satisfy You, playing on his car radio in Phoenix, and was impressed. Bear wasted no time in recording both Just to Satisfy You and Four Strong Winds. Intrigued, Bear stopped in Phoenix to see Jennings perform live at JD's, then called Chet Atkins, head of RCA Victor Studios in Nashville, recommending Jennings for a contract. Faced with a tempting offer from RCA, Jennings had to make a tough decision. Unsure whether to leave his successful gig at JD's and move to Nashville, he turned to Willie Nelson for advice. Nelson, who had seen Jennings perform and succeed at JD's, advised him to stay in Phoenix. Encouraged by Nelson's words, Jennings asked Herb Alpert to release him from his contract with A&M. Alpert, recognizing Jennings' potential, agreed. Ironically, A&M later put together all of Jennings' singles and unreleased recordings into an album titled Don't Think Twice cashing in on his rising popularity. In 1965, Jennings officially joined RCA Victor, with Chet Atkins finalizing the deal. That August, Jennings made his debut on Billboard's Hot Country Songs chart with the song, That's the Chance I'll Have to Take, marking the start of his journey to becoming a country music star, the Nashville Sound. In 1966, Waylon Jennings began his RCA Victor journey with the release of Folk Country, marking a significant career advancement. This was followed by notable albums like Leave in Town and Nashville Rebel, which further bolstered his standing in country music. Leave in Town saw success with its singles Anita, You're Dreaming, and Time to Bum Again, both reaching number 17 on the Billboard Hot Country Songs chart. The album's rendition of Gordon Lightfoot's That's What You Get for Lovin' Me climbed even higher, peaking at number 9, marking Jennings' first top 10 single. Meanwhile, Nashville Rebel served as a soundtrack, showcasing his versatility. The single Green River achieved an impressive peak at number 11 on the Billboard Country Singles chart. In 1967, Jennings continued his streak with the hit single Just to Satisfy You, a nod to his rockabilly roots. This era also saw the release of albums like Just to Satisfy You, solidifying Jennings' status as a chart-topping artist. Throughout the late 1960s, Jennings consistently found chart success with singles like The Chokin' Kind and Only Daddy That'll Walk the Line. In 1969, his collaboration on MacArthur Park earned him a Grammy Award, showcasing his musical versatility. With hits like Brown-Eyed Handsome Man, Jennings continued to impress audiences with his unique blend of country and rock influences. During this period, Waylon Jennings shared a Nashville apartment with the iconic Johnny Cash, both managed by Lucky Muller's booking agency, Muller Talent Inc. Embarking on tours organized by the agency, 
They faced logistical challenges with distant venues and packed schedules. As they traversed the country, Jennings and Cash encountered financial strain due to travel and accommodation expenses, leading Jennings to seek advances to cover costs. His reliance on amphetamines to cope with the demanding tour exacerbated his debt, leaving him feeling trapped in a cycle he described as the circuit. In 1972, Jennings released Ladies Love Outlaws, a chart-topping hit marking his entry into outlaw country, a subgenre challenging Nashville's mainstream sound. However, Jennings faced resistance from Nashville producers favoring the country-politan style, which clashed with his desire for artistic freedom. Frustrated, he felt constrained in his musical expression despite his success. Outlaw Country by 1972, Waylon Jennings faced a pivotal moment in his career after releasing Ladies Love Outlaws and nearing the end of his recording contract. However, fate intervened when he fell ill with hepatitis and was hospitalized. Struggling with the idea of retiring due to disillusionment with the Nashville scene, Jennings received a visit from his drummer Richie Albright, whose support convinced him to persevere. Albright suggested seeking help from manager Neil Reshin. Financially strained during his recovery, Jennings requested a $25,000 advance from RCA, but a $5,000 signing bonus offer from them on the day he met Reshin changed the course of events. With Reshin's counsel, Jennings declined the offer and hired Reshin as his manager. Under Reshin's guidance, Jennings began renegotiating contracts, a process that led to a transformative meeting between Reshin and Willie Nelson. This led to Reshin managing both artists, setting the stage for their future success. Jennings' new deal with RCA, facilitated by Reshin, secured a substantial $75,000 advance and granted him unprecedented artistic freedom. Embracing the outlaw country movement, Reshin advised Jennings to maintain his rugged beard, enhancing his image as a rebel in the genre. As Jennings's fame grew, so did Willie Nelson's, with his success at Atlantic Records and influence in Austin catching the industry's eye. RCA hurried to renegotiate with Jennings, unwilling to lose him to a rival label amidst Nelson's ascent. In 1973, Jennings released two pivotal albums, Lonesome, Henri and Mean, and Honky Tonk Heroes, the first under his complete creative control. This newfound freedom marked a turning point, leading to his most successful years both critically and commercially. Following this, Jennings continued his chart dominance with hits like This Time and The Ramblin' Man in 1974. Both title tracks reached number one on the Billboard Country Singles chart with This Time being Jennings' own composition. The momentum continued with Dreaming My Dreams in 1975, featuring the chart topper Are You Sure Hank Done It This Way? This album earned Jennings his first gold certification and sparked a streak of six consecutive solo studio albums achieving gold status or higher. In 1976, Jennings made history with Are You Ready for the Country? Despite initial resistance from RCA, he enlisted producer Ken Mansfield and funded the recording himself, resulting in an album that topped the Billboard Country Albums chart three times and held the number one spot for 10 weeks. Are You Ready for the Country garnered widespread acclaim, named Country Album of the Year by Record World magazine, and earning another gold certification from the RIAA. Jennings' bold artistic vision solidified his legacy as an outlaw country icon. In the same year, RCA Records released Wanted the Outlaws, a groundbreaking compilation featuring Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson, Tom Paul Glazer, and Jesse Coulter. This seminal album became the first ever country music album to achieve platinum certification, setting a new standard for success in the genre. Continuing his success, RCA released Ole Waylon in the following year, featuring the chart-topping duet with Willie Nelson, Luckenbach, Texas. Their chemistry led to the subsequent release of Waylon and Willie in 1978, with the hit single Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up To Be Cowboys. Despite his fame, Jennings began to feel constrained by the outlaw image that propelled him to stardom. In his poignant song, Don't You Think This Outlaw Bits Done Got Out Of Hand, he pondered its overuse, lamenting its transformation into a caricature. In 1979, RCA Records released Jennings' first greatest hits compilation, which went on to achieve quintuple platinum status in 2002, showcasing his lasting impact on country music. Beyond music, Jennings joined the cast of the CBS series The Dukes of Hazard" in 1979, portraying the balladeer and performing the iconic theme song Good Old Boys. 
The song became his 12th number one hit on the Billboard Country Singles chart and reached number 21 on the Billboard Hot 100 chart, achieving crossover success. Later years. In the mid-1980s, Waylon Jennings teamed up with country music legends Johnny Cash, Chris Christopherson, and Willie Nelson to form the celebrated supergroup known as The Highwaymen. Their combined talent and remarkable chemistry led to widespread acclaim, captivating audiences worldwide with their iconic collaborations. While contributing to The Highwaymen's success, Jennings continued to pursue his individual path in the music industry. In 1982, he achieved gold album status with WW2, a collaborative project with Willie Nelson that garnered praise from fans and critics alike. In 1985, Jennings participated in the historic recording of We Are the World with the USA for Africa. However, a disagreement over the song's lyrics, particularly those in Swahili, led to his early departure from the studio. Despite experiencing a dip in sales during this time, Jennings remained resilient. He signed with MCA Records and released Will the Wolf Survive in 1985, which topped Billboard's Country Albums chart in 1986, reaffirming his enduring appeal to listeners. Jennings also explored the realm of film, making a cameo appearance in the live-action children's movie Sesame Street Presents Follow That Bird in 1985. In the film, he played a turkey farm truck driver and showcased his musical prowess by performing the song Ain't No Road Too Long. In 1993, Waylon Jennings expanded his repertoire by delving into children's entertainment. Collaborating with Rinkum Children's Entertainment, he released the album Cowboys, Sisters, Rascals and Dirt, which included the touching tribute Shooter's Theme, dedicated to his son. In 1994, Jennings made a notable cameo in the film Maverick, alongside stars like Mel Gibson and Jodie Foster, further solidifying his status as a cultural icon. Right for the Time, released in 1996, demonstrated Jennings' enduring musical skill and dedication to his craft. However, by 1997, following the Lollapalooza tour, Jennings opted to reduce his demanding tour schedule to prioritize family life. In 1998, Jennings joined forces with Bobby Bear, Jerry Reed, and Mel Tillis to form The Old Dogs, recording a double album featuring songs by Shel Silverstein. In 1999, Jennings formed Waylon and the Waymore Blues Band, consisting mainly of former Wailers, thrilling audiences with soulful performances until 2001. As his health declined, Jennings made the tough decision to retire from touring. In January 2000, he recorded his final album, Never Say Die Live, at Nashville's Ryman Auditorium, preserving his unparalleled talent and lasting legacy in music history. Personal Life Waylon Jennings led a vibrant personal life, characterized by four marriages and six children. His first marriage to Maxine Carol Lawrence in 1956 resulted in four children, Terry Vance, Julie Ray, Buddy Dean, and Dina Carroll, before their eventual divorce. In 1962, Jennings married Lynn Jones, and they adopted a daughter named Tommy Lynn before parting ways in 1967. Following this, Jennings wed Barbara Elizabeth Rood. Despite these tumultuous relationships, Jennings found inspiration in his music, notably composing the song This Time, reflecting on the challenges of marriage and divorce, which later became his first number one hit in 1974. However, it was his marriage to country singer Jesse Coulter in 1969 that became a cornerstone of his personal life. Together, they blended their families, with Coulter bringing her daughter Jennifer from a previous marriage to Dwayne Eddy into the fold. In 1979, they welcomed their son, Waylon Albright, affectionately known as Shooter Jennings. Despite enduring struggles, particularly Jennings' battles with drugs and alcohol in the early 1980s, which nearly led to divorce, the couple persevered. Jennings ultimately conquered his demons, and in 1990, after retiring from touring, he pursued his GED to set an example for his son Shooter about the importance of education. Studying for his GED by watching educational programs on the Kentucky Educational Television Network while on his tour bus in 1989, Jennings showcased his commitment to personal growth and family values. Struggle with Substance Abuse Waylon Jennings faced a significant struggle with substance abuse, particularly with amphetamines and cocaine, which cast a shadow over his otherwise illustrious career. It was during his time living with Johnny Cash in the mid-1960s that Jennings began consuming amphetamines, describing them as the artificial energy fueling the Nashville music scene. 
The peak of his troubles occurred in 1977, when federal agents arrested him on charges of conspiracy and possession of cocaine with intent to distribute. A package containing 27 grams of cocaine sent to Jennings from a colleague in New York triggered the attention of a private courier, leading to involvement from the Drug Enforcement Administration. Although authorities searched Jennings's recording studio, no evidence was found as he had disposed of the drug while awaiting a search warrant. Eventually, the charges against him were dropped, but the incident profoundly impacted Jennings, inspiring his song, Don't You Think This Outlaw Bits Done Got Out of Hand. Throughout the early 1980s, Jennings's cocaine addiction escalated, reaching a point where he was spending up to $1,500 a day to sustain his habit, resulting in financial ruin and debts of up to $2.5 million. Determined to conquer his addiction, he underwent a month-long detoxification process at a home in the Phoenix area. His son, Shooter, served as a significant source of inspiration for Jennings to break free from his addiction, leading him to quit cocaine for good in 1984. Despite the challenges he faced on the road to sobriety, Jennings' determination to reclaim his life and his role as a father ultimately empowered him to overcome his addiction and regain control of his career and personal well-being. Health Battles and Death Decades of excessive smoking, drug use, obesity, and poor diet took a toll on Waylon Jennings' health. Despite quitting cocaine in 1984 and his six-pack-a-day smoking habit in 1988, the damage had already been done. In 1988, he underwent heart bypass surgery to address the consequences of his lifestyle choices. However, complications from type 2 diabetes, worsened by his smoking and drug use, continued to plague him. By the early 2000s, Jennings's diabetes had severely deteriorated, causing debilitating pain and limited mobility. Despite a surgery in 2000 to improve circulation in his left leg, his condition worsened. In December 2001, he faced a tragic setback when his left foot had to be amputated at a hospital in Phoenix, further complicating his health struggles. On February 13, 2002, Jennings passed away peacefully in his sleep at his home in Chandler, Arizona, at the age of 64, succumbing to complications of diabetes. He was laid to rest at the city of Mesa Cemetery in nearby Mesa. At his memorial service on February 15, his wife, Jesse Coulter, paid tribute by singing Storms Never Last, honoring Jennings's enduring legacy in country music. Legacy Waylon Jennings's enduring impact on country music is undeniable. With a career marked by impressive chart success and numerous accolades, he achieved 96 singles on Billboard's Hot Country Singles chart between 1965 and 1991, 16 of which reached the top spot. Additionally, 54 of his albums charted on Billboard's Top Country Albums between 1966 and 1995, with 11 reaching number one. In recognition of his contributions, Littlefield, Texas honored his legacy by renaming a major road Waylon Jennings Boulevard and inducting him into the Texas Country Music Hall of Fame in 1999. In October 2001, he was inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame, and he received the Cliffy Stone Pioneer Award from the Academy of Country Music in June 2007. His influence extended beyond country music, leading to his induction into Guitar Center's Rock Walk in Hollywood, California in July 2006. Many artists, including Hank Williams Jr., Travis Tritt, Steve Earle, and his son Shooter Jennings, cite him as a significant influence. Even after his passing, Jennings' music remained beloved by audiences. Posthumous releases like Waylon Forever, with his son Shooter, and Going Down Rockin' The Last Recordings kept his music alive. Additionally, Waylon, The Music Inside, featuring covers of his songs by various artists, further solidified his enduring impact. Jennings' estate has thrived beyond music, with ventures such as a clothing line and discussions of a biographical film. His influence continues to resonate, ensuring that his legacy lives on for generations to come. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.